the talk that I'm going to give today is, um, the topic is called Pricing Models for Android Enterprise Applications. Even though I have some slides, mainly it's more going to be a open uh, chat kind of thing, uh, where, um, of course, if you want, we can go through all the slides, it will take half an hour, but that will leave only 10 minutes or so for questions. So that way, <coughs> we can keep it either way. If you want uh, the talk to be less and question and answer to be more, it's feel free. You can stop me in between if you have a question or something, or we can move all the questions in the end. Whichever works out, we will just uh, use that. So <coughs> what I'll do is I'll start with um, a small uh, slide. Uh, I won't take too much of uh, time. I'll talk quickly about our company. So uh, my company name is CRM ID. Uh, as the name suggests, we are into CRM implementation. So that's our uh, primary business, and um, we have done more than 100 implementations across the globe for various kinds of customers, from banks to uh, universities to pharma companies and so on. So that's our main business. But what we started doing is last couple of years, we started uh, making CRM mobile applications. So we have worked on um, uh, Android as one of our primary uh, platforms, but we also have apps in BlackBerry and iPhone. But our focus is mainly on Android. And uh, these are our uh, websites, crmit.com and crmplusplus.com, and you have some slides to go through. So that is just to give a quick background about who we are. Uh, <coughs> because our entire focus is on enterprise applications, I thought I'll talk about um, that, especially how to price enterprise applications. This is something that, that we have tried, we have made some mistakes, we have learned, and probably we are still making some mistakes and then trying to learn. I thought I'll share all that with you. So uh, basically the conflict starts in fun versus productivity kind of a, that's a classic question. How much of the enterprise application has to be uh, easy to use, has to be fun? People say, hey, after all, it's an enterprise application, it need not be fun, just go ahead and uh, design it whichever way you want with probably you would have seen classic uh, PC based enterprise apps with 20 buttons probably some 100 plus menu options and so on. But in mobile world, probably that doesn't work. So here the challenge is, how do we balance this? Productivity should be there. If the job is to be done, then it has to be, that feature has to be there. At the same time, the application has to be intuitive and it has to be fun. So that is, that's where the um, classic puzzle starts. And <clears throat> to make things more complex, the expectations from people are entirely different in these two aspects, fun and productivity. For example, when you look at BlackBerry, it is seen more like a enterprise phone. So people assume BlackBerry apps can be as dull as possible. That's the uh, typical uh, mindset. People won't mind. They won't even complain, actually. You give them a really dull app, but it's OK. After all, it's BlackBerry app, and it is supposed to look that way. Okay? Whereas iPhone, even if you give, you, give a superb functional rich application, if it is not intuitive, if it is not using the iPhone image, then people start saying, hey, it's not good enough. So it's that that's a conflict. Fortunately, Android is in a, um, probably a place where things are still not clear. Is Android a fun phone? Is Android a business phone? Is it something mixed? Is it possible? First of all, nobody has achieved that combination yet. So can Android do it? That's a bigger question. Let's not get into that. But as app developers, the challenge we have is how our application should look like, how our application should behave. Especially when you, if you're building a game, this question probably will not even come to you. It's very clear. It's entertainment. It's fun. You want to design it as per that. But when you're designing an enterprise app, that's where the balance comes into picture. So that's the thing. One thing that we need to remember is just because these uh, existing brand images are there, it doesn't mean enterprises are going to jump into conclusion. For example, you make a beautiful, fun-filled entertainment application. Somebody may just pay $1, $2, $5, and then just download it and use it for two, three days. If they don't like it, they will just throw it away. Whereas enterprise apps are not like that. They are typically not bought by one or two people. They are bought by a corporation for 100, 200 people. So it is like you are trying to um, convince a committee about your app, not a single person. That that uh, mindset has to be with you. So that means, today morning, I will give you an example of a session we had 
with one of our clients who is sitting in Taiwan. And it was a really funny situation because the entire development team was here. We have developed the app. We have an Android tablet here in which we are running the app. It's running beautifully. But our salesperson is sitting in uh, Taiwan, sitting with the customer in their office. He is also having a same tablet. But what's happening is the experience that we see here, the experience that he sees there is not same. And he's in front of a committee. Some 10, 12 people are sitting and then seeing it and saying, hey, why it works this way? It is not supposed to work this way. But for us developers, it works, everything, everything is working fine. So finally, we were forced to kind of get into an approach whereby we record a video, send it to them, play the video to them just to give them a feel of how the app feels like. And immediately, they started giving things like, hey, can this be done? Can that be done? Kind of thing. Uh, the meeting transformed from um, um, originally those committee members were there to see our app and say it's good or bad. But now what they started doing, they started asking, can you do this, can you do that kind of thing. And end of the day, it becomes like they get ideas when they look at the application. So that's a mistake we did. We should have probably shown them a dummy uh, HTML prototype and shown it to them, got their comments, and then developed everything as per their requirements and then present. That would have given a totally different uh, uh, picture. Now, that's a learning for us. End of today's demo, we are disappointed. The committee didn't like our app. They said it still lacks all those things. And we were frustrated because you never told us these features are required. You are only telling now. So they are saying, I only thought about it now. Go and build. So that's a, that's a conflict here. Building for enterprise is a tough thing. Uh, especially when you have a committee. If a single person is there, yes, you can please or um, you can somehow convince them to go for it. So that's why we have to be very careful when you are building enterprise um, apps. These are the typical expectations that we have seen in our clients. Of course, you may have something more to add to this list. This is from our experience. So typically, enterprises are asking for these. Number one, they want flexibility. So I'm not going to buy same phone for everybody. I'm not even going to buy same technology for everybody. They will say, hey, let's say 30% of my workforce already has BlackBerry. I don't want to throw it away. Probably another 10% is having iPhone. Only for the rest 60% I'm buying uh, Android phones. Now, build something which works on all three platforms. That is one expectation. People don't want to invest, except those companies which are still not gone mobile and they're starting now. So they can take a call, okay, I'll buy Android to everybody kind of a decision, but that is very rare. So first one is flexibility has to be there. Does that mean you develop for three platforms, 10 platforms? What if to, now today, Nokia and Microsoft have come up with a new um, uh, OS. What are we going to do? Are we going to have a fourth version of our app? That's the first conflict you have. Second, security. When compared to all other apps, enterprise apps require maximum security in two aspects, communication and storage. Communication, typically these enterprises will have VPNs and uh, firewalls and all sorts of things. Let's say your application should be able to take care of that communication requirement. Storage, if somebody leaves the job, I should be able to wipe out everything in their phone. Or if somebody loses the phone, somebody steals the phone, it should be secure enough so that somebody else who is getting the phone is not getting all the business data. So that's the second uh, major thing you have to think of. Third, data ownership. When you are offline, you do a lot of things. When you are offline, somebody else has come online and they have done a lot of things here. So what happens now? Uh, two people trying to edit the same kind of data from two different places. Or two people using offline Android um, devices have modified the same data. So what happens now? So that is very important. People want very clear. This is one of the primary questions people will ask. When are you talking about offline apps? The moment you mention the word offline in your presentation or your pitch or whatever, the first question they're going to have is tell me how you're going to con handle your conflicts. What are the rules? Can do I have flexibility to control them? So that's, that's another challenge. Of course, offline capabilities a must these days, especially in India. If you're developing apps for India, offline capability will be seen as one of the primary things. So we have observed that 90% of your application or probably 90 plus percentage of your application should work without internet connection. This is the expectation. That's what enterprises have. They say, do everything local, press one sync button, everything should go online. So that's it. More than 90% people expect things to happen offline. That is one of the reasons why people go for these kind of devices. Then confidential uh, data is there, then protecting that data and preventing misuse, all sorts of things. It, it, it's all, the, 
the questions that enterprise people have when you go in front of them and pitching a application. Now, how do we deal with these? Now, yeah. Can, can I yeah, ask you for a while? What yeah. I want to know is when I am from a consumer app background, I really don't understand what a uh, CRM app is. Okay. Can you uh, give a list of some example CRM apps or use cases? Okay. Uh, actually, I am not talking about CRM apps in this presentation. But to answer your question, I think I have the very next slide. No. Yeah, this slide. So you see a big set of uh, apps. Office applications, CRM applications, supply chain management, ERP, enterprise micro blogging, blogging, so on. So these are, typ but typically most of the people would have seen timesheet apps, uh, expense report kind of apps. Um, these two are very common. And office apps, these days office apps are no more enterprise apps. Even though they are called office, they are no more enterprise apps. They are seen more like a personal productivity tools, but I will still say it's a kind of overlapping. So these are popular examples. These are probably more niche. Excuse me. Yeah. Question here. Yeah. You talked about how some apps need to more cater to the usability and other apps to the functionality as well. Right. So in these apps, can you give us an example of an enterprise app that needs to cater more to usability or you know, where usability becomes a bigger focus? Okay, see, I, I can, I mean, I'm, I'm not a heavy user of other apps. I can talk about our apps, what uh, we did. One app that I can talk about is this MSCM, SCM is Supply Chain Management. So this MSCM app is something that we have developed. There is a free version available in the market and there is a paid version which we are selling it to enterprises directly. So when you look at this app, this app is a very simple app. A sales rep on the field goes to shops, let's say a pharma company. So I go to every medicine shop, they say, these are the 10 medicines I manufacture. I want this, I want this, I want this, I don't want this. And each one I'm giving a quantity, I'm basically recording it. And end of the day I come to office and synchronize everything with the server. Very simple, dull, boring application. We did it and we showed it and then people liked it. They all uh, liked it and then uh, it, it, it was good. But the moment people started using it, they came up with ideas. One very simple thing that people wanted is, uh, why, why can't I just uh, take the signature of the uh, person on the device itself so that I avoid one step of acknowledgement. Otherwise they have to print acknowledgement, they have to get the signature there, go back to office, file it and all those things. So it's a simple thing, very simple. I mean, in phone, signing is not a difficult deal at all. But for that application, it made a lot of sense. And second one that they wanted is they wanted simple things like, hey, this particular product is no more sold in this particular um, uh, store. So there should be some way I tell the company that, hey, this guy is not buying this product anymore. Remove it from his list. This is another example. Like that, what happened is people started coming up with their own ideas. And it could be UI related ideas also. They say, why oh, should I click every tab? Can't I swipe? When I swipe, it should go to the next tab. When I do the reverse swipe, it should go to the previous tab. That saves a lot of time in uh, data entry. Basically, they stand in front of a pharma guy and they keep entering. If the whole data entry takes 10 minutes and because of some usability improvements, it becomes 8 minutes, that itself is a big number for them. So that's where the usability enhancements, probably they will not be able to visualize it. But the moment they start using it, they come up with ideas. Is this possible? Is that possible? Kind of all sorts of things they will come up with. And then we introduce things like taking a photograph of uh, the display. Uh, for example, you are in a pharma company and your products are displayed properly or somewhere else products are not displayed properly in your uh, area, your competitor product is there. So you want to take pictures of them and then send it to the headquarters so that the action is taken. All sorts of things, we, we started adding it to the application. So it always starts with a feature rich application and then slowly we start adding the um, UI elements to it. Unless and until the enterprise to whom you are talking to already has a UI engineer or UI team which already says, which already knows how to make their applications better. If that is there, then that's probably the good, good case. They will tell you what to do. Otherwise, you are forced to guess and then do it. So, yeah. about, uh, some of the things we talked about in the previous slide, uh, yeah. about the, what, what uh, enterprise expect from people who are developing stuff, right? right. For some reason, I find it more like you are talking about the, uh, I mean, it felt more like you are going towards more like an HTML5 version of the app mm -hmm. versus a native application of the app. Right? Okay, fine. I mean, I was trying to relate in that sense because most of the things which you said wouldn't happen if it was a HTML5 app. 
Okay, fine. Most of the things would happen if it was a native app because you would have to provide support for each and every single thing. Right. Right. So, I mean, what is your view on that? See, actually, uh, most enterprise uh, applications do they rely on HTML5 app to build? I mean, internally they use HTML5. They just show up a UI which looks like a native UI, but it's not really a native UI because it's it's built up of HTML5. Right? Do they do that, or almost applica uh, enterprise applications do they build natively for each Android and iOS and BlackBerry and blah blah? blah. Uh, to answer your question, this entire presentation was prepared based on our uh, experience in building Android native apps. Okay, We do work on HTML5, but this presentation doesn't talk about that. But this kind of technology is not an important thing, but not an important thing here. Okay, uh, What I mean to say is, you your point is, some of these problems may be solved by technology. Yeah, most of them in fact are right. HTML5. So now, what it means is, we are getting into a framework kind of a scenario where we build a framework and on top of the framework, anything that we build will take care of these things automatically. HTML5 is here a framework. On top of it, we can build something which may be a native app which internally uses HTML5 or it may be a browser based app, it may be anything. So the point here is, as long as, irrespective of technology, as long as you make sure that your app takes care of these things, you are safe. I'm only, I added this slide to move people from the uh, normal development mindset to what you should expect when you're walking into uh, pitching an enterprise. That was my point. I'm not saying you should go for HTML5 or you should not go for HTML5 or something like that. That's not the point at all. Here, these are the expectations from the enterprise, uh, what do you say, customers, to use that word. And as long as your technology takes care of them, it may be HTML5, it may be something else also, I think you are safe. Like I said, if you use HTML5, some of these things, lot of the, in fact, a lot of these things can be taken care of automatically. So that may be your solution. I'm not talking about development at all here. Sure. I'm only talking about pricing. Uh, just uh, uh, back to the same uh, discussion. Uh -huh. uh, you mentioned price, right? So right. it comes down to that point your technology. The applications that you mentioned uh, in another slide, uh, enterprise applications. Right. Uh, typically, applications which are existing uh, prior to mobile en enablement. So right. They are there. They are desktop based applications or web based applications, browser based applications. And just because you want an additional enabler or additional channel, you are kind of bringing subset of that functionality onto the mobile device. Correct. Right. So essentially, there will be a lot of reuse uh, concept. I mean, uh, these things are already they have built up in this particular uh, uh, architecture. I think we use most of it. Right, right. back end. So, uh, optimal uh, reuse of uh, whatever components. So, now in that particular, uh, and that's where price comes. Right. Because otherwise, you will start building from scratch the same thing. In this particular case, native versus hybrid or web or whatever, these things will definitely come into discussion, right? Because you're talking about cost, price, effort, time, everything. Yes. Yeah, I, I actually, you, your point is right. For example, the MSCM that I'm talking about was developed from the scratch. There was no other app. Whereas MCRM, there was already an app that we built for a different purpose. We just enabled a mobile channel too. So that way, we were able to reuse some of the things, but only in the back end. So that's where it's like, uh, when you are deciding the price, in fact, I'm to come to the pricing, real pricing part of it. But when you are deciding to build an application, you should plan as much reuse as possible in the back end. That is uh, our observation. But front end, it is better to 100% redesign without even worrying about what's a PC design. Most of the times when we try to bring PC design as it is to mobile, it flops. It flops, that's, that's our experience. It's basic, it, in fact, it helps not to show your design of the PC application. Tell them this is the functionality, go and design something really innovative. Right, but then what, what percentage of, what is the overlap mm -hmm. if you are talking about developing a pure native application? Mm -hmm. Because let's say the applications that you have are either uh, a product uh, application, like SAP, ERP kind of things, or uh, you have a custom web based or a browser based application in the there. So it has its own architecture. So okay. you are talking about uh, creating an Android video application or an iOS video application. Hmm. To what extent can you reuse those components will really be the deciding factor? Uh, see, it depends on the, like you like rightly said, it depends on the architecture and to what level the original developers were honest and uh, whatever, uh, loyal to the architecture. I would use that word. Uh, for example, MVC seems to be the solution to this problem. If MVC was followed rigidly in every app in the world, 
probably it's very easy for us to build just the um, uh, view part for every mobile phone and then probably save a lot of effort, but it doesn't happen. Yeah. So what we have observed is if you are able to use 40% of your effort, you're lucky. That's what we have observed. More than 50% gets favored. Yes. Isn't integration with your existing legacy applications in the enterprise not a limitation? Yes, it is a limitation. In fact, it's it's a part of the next slide. So these are the things it continues actually, it was not complete, more enterprise expectation. So your backend connectivity, SaaS connectivity, access control, for example, I have 30,000 employees, all of them are already there in an LDAP server. If your mobile app doesn't talk to that LDAP server, I don't care what app, what features you have. I'm not going to enter all those 30,000 people again in your system and maintain two different authentication mechanisms. For me, it should talk to my system. So access control, authentication, backend connectivity, SaaS connectivity, these days most of the apps are moving to the web, uh, in, to the cloud, the software as a service model. So that they want, then reusing existing investments like he rightly pointed out. Uh, they want to reuse. I have already invested so much of money and energy into building this. I'm not going to buy something totally new. For example, one classic case is recently we faced the problem. We were trying to <coughs> pitch a HR application to a company. They already have a timesheet uh, uh, application. So they clearly said, we don't want your timesheet module. Our timesheet module is already done. Everything is working fine. We will use all other pieces, but only if your app talks to our timesheet application and uses that data, then I'm interested in buying your product. So as far as they are concerned, their investment is to be protected. So that is something you have to be able to accommodate. If you say, no, my architecture is really great. I will not talk to any other system. Then finally, you are going to be probably having a very narrow set of customers. You will not be able to uh, go uh, to the entire breadth of uh, options. Then um, protection against future technology changes, of course, it is very difficult, but still people expect you to justify, hey, uh, today I'm buying your app. Let's say one year down the line, something else comes up which totally makes your app irrelevant. Uh, what, what, what answer you have? So that way, that's why they are expecting you. They, they are they are not expecting you to give a uh, what do you say um, uh, crystal glass view kind of a thing of future. What they are saying is how ready you are. Are you following the industry trends? Are you uh, are you aware of what is happening in the industry and are you ready to? Uh, take up that when it happens kind of a thing. So that is also important. And then between IT managers and the uh, developers, uh, sorry, IT managers and the users. So security versus usability, like uh, she rightly pointed out. So those kind of things, there are a lot of things, I think uh, the slides are available, you can go through that due to time reasons. I'm not going through every, every one of them, but I just want to stress to the point that the expectations are entirely different. It is like speaking two different languages. Even though Android is common, even though HTML5 may be common, you keep using the same technology. But end of the day, developing a regular app is not same as developing an enterprise app. You need a totally different mindset for it. It is like writing a newspaper article versus writing a research paper. I'm not saying it's complex. I'm just saying it is more uh, a different environment and you need to remodel your thought process itself for that environment. So uh, these are some of the advantages of Android and disadvantages. I think most of these you are aware. I'm not going to stress on them. Now, this will be in the minds of the enterprise customers to whom you are talking to. So remember that these questions will be there, definitely. So they will say, hey, there is fragmentation. What is your answer to that? What if one of my users has a really bad, bad cell phone and your app refuses to perform? What is your strategy for that? Uh, uh, what if I don't have connectivity in uh, some areas? Can you do it through SMS? All sorts of questions come into picture. This is something which is constantly in the mind of uh, enterprise buyers. Because their jobs are on the line if they've made a wrong purchase. This is just a sample. So what I'll do is I'll directly go to the pricing models. This also you would have seen elsewhere. Um, the typical pricing models, these are the pricing models which are normally used for enterprise apps. One is paper download, it's a very simple model. Uh, pay five dollars, three dollars, one dollar, whatever it is, download and then start using it. It's as simple as no headache. Second one is subscription based model where we call it as it's a um, mobile app as a service kind of thing. So you pay probably zero cost upfront, 
then every month you pay 99, 99 cents or something like that for using the service. There also you can, there are advantages, you can enable feature by feature. You can say, pay 15 cents extra and I'll give you this module extra kind of. Thing. So you have a flexibility. There. So that's the second model. Third model is a freemium model where you give a demo version and if they like it, they can pay and then upgrade to a full version. Fourth one is an ad funded model where you show the ads. Fifth one is in-app purchases or a combination of these. Uh, when you look at the enterprise scenario, this is our observation. What works and what doesn't. The general apps and enterprise apps. One thing very clearly, ad funded apps are not working for uh, enterprise apps. This example I have, once um, one of my colleagues told me, I don't know how true it is or he made up the story, once he was showing an ad funded app demo to a customer and it showed their competitors app. And they were kind of like, uh, from there the meeting went downhill kind of a thing. So it's it's like, okay, that's not the reason I'm saying. Uh, probably ad funded are more opt when you're going for a general. People are okay. I'll see ad now and then, but still I get a great app for free kind of thing. Uh, but if you look at it, a combination works a lot. That's where I put a five star based on our rating. Use a combination of these two. Subscription model, paper download, and freemium. These three, when you combine, you're able to uh, do a lot of uh, uh, justification. That's what I would say. That's the word I would I'd use. So this is our observation. Of course, this may change. Android is yet to introduce some of these features. Um, so uh, as Android does that, I think we will see a different trend, probably one year down the line, this will become more mature. But as of now, this is our observation. I think I'll just uh, go ahead with uh, our um, recommendations, uh, because of time reasons, I only have five more minutes. This is what we have observed, which works for enterprise apps. Start with a uh, free version or a light version. This is something which works in both general apps as well as corporate apps. Start with a free app. Do it in such a way that give it away Anybody can download and then play with it kind of a thing. A short version, limited features. Start there. Then make a lot of noise. Talk about it. Have a dedicated blog. That is something which is important. Keep talking about it. Some people use cases. How people are using your application. How people are finding it uh, difficult. What features they want. They've asked for it. What is the pipeline. Keep telling about it and then uh, post all these things to your social media channels. That is something we have observed. Uh, that talking about the app is very important. But at the same time, it has to be very uh, subtle. It shouldn't be like all caps showing. And another thing, uh, in your app, always have a about us or premium page. Uh, many developers don't, uh, they, they make this mistake, basically. Great app, there is no about us page. There is no like, how do I buy the full version or what did this guy develop other things? I have to go to market and see. That is uh, a wrong model. Your app should say more about you. Just add about us kind of a button, on click a bit, talk about you, give the link to your website and stuff like that. That is something which is a real, real value add. If required, you can also say, first time when you're running the app, you have to register. That way you have everybody's mail ID so that you can push messages, but at the same time, you have to take care of all the privacy uh, uh, constraints. And um, another thing, um, this is all talking about uh, sharing and having a website. Yeah, this is another thing I want to stress, translate. Uh, enterprise apps are useful when you translate. So we have observed that even the tiniest application, it may have just three, four pages and then doing some very simple stuff. The moment you translate it and then uh, say, hey, I support eight languages, the, the way enterprises look at you is different because most of the companies these days have a global uh, for workforce and they all want, whether they use it or not is a different story. Some of the companies have English as their global uh, business la business communication language, but still they say, is it supported kind of a thing. So that is something it supports. But be careful, if you are using Google Translate, that's where we all start. So you'll be using some translator tool to auto-translate and do it. Be careful about some countries which are very specific about this machine translation, especially Japan. We had a very bad experience. Uh, we did a mission translation, did a Japanese app, and then went and showed it to a client. And they were literally laughing at us. They're saying, what sort of language is this? Who wrote this? When we said it's mission translation, they understood, okay. Now, they didn't really feel bad about us, but they still felt bad about the whole situation. They said, hey, this is not the way Japanese is spoken or written. You guys have got everything wrong. Uh, so that way, I think you have to be careful. If the deal is good enough, better invest in a uh, real translator who reads and then says, yes, this translation is good or bad. So if you want some samples, 
uh, just try any Indian language translation in Google for one paragraph, just one paragraph of text, you will know how uh, how Absolutely. idiotic it is in some cases. Yes, it's a good start, but it's not good enough for enterprise groups. So that is something which is important. Okay, and uh, moving from free to paid, this is where uh, it's, it's very important. What typically happens is, um, it's, it's normally it's done on a case by case basis. It's not like same formula will work for everybody. Some companies will say, hey, I'll go per user per month model. Some companies will say, I'll go per user model, but I won't pay anything per month, I'll pay upfront cost. Some people will say, depending on the modules I use, I'll pay you. So normally for enterprise applications, one price list does not work. That's our observation. In fact, every customer with whom we have worked on on the mobile space, we have had a separate price list for it. That's my observation. I don't have two customers who are asking for the same pricing model till now. Uh, so that, that, that's what happens in enterprise apps, unlike general apps. In general apps, it's very clear. Okay, you pay four ninety nine dollars and that's it. Or you pay zero and pay ninety nine cents every month. It's very clear. It's it's kind of same price for everybody. But in enterprises, it's different for different enterprises. That's what we have observed. I think uh, just to summarize, these are the three points that are kind of a takeaway kind of thing. Uh, pricing model as well as pricing process for uh, uh, enterprise app is entirely different from a general app. That is one point. Number two, but these two have a common thing which is starting with a free version. Once the free version works, then they will move to the... We have observed that the hit rate is somewhere around 20 to 30 percent as of now. But it will improve depending on your app uh, quality. And uh, talk a lot about your app until your customers start talking about it. So I think those are the three points, and uh, I think that completes my uh, uh, slides. So we can take up questions. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you said you spoke about the pricing cost. Yes. So is there some sort of value base that you what is how do you okay? Uh, see, typically what we do is we have a fixed price list. Right. Okay. We invested this much money on building this application and I want to retrieve it in 18 months, 36 months, 60 months, whatever it is. That's a standard price. That's in a perfect world, it will work. Everybody will go and pay whatever price I'm saying and I'll retrieve, ret recover that cost. Now, once that is done, now I take the client. The client comes and says, hey, if you give me this kind of pricing, they're not bargaining. They're saying, your per user per month model is not working for me. This is the model which is working for me. If you give me in this price, then I can give you a guarantee of 5,000 users in 36 months, kind of a thing. So now you recalculate. Okay, if I go by my regular price list, this is the benefit. If I go by this commitment that the customer is giving, this is the benefit. Then I compare and then I take a call. It is very difficult. There is no real mathematical formula here. You have to basically, it's, it's more like how it works, is, at least in our case, more happy customers are there, we are confident that the product will grow. So what we are doing is, initial days when we release the product, we are ready to make compromises. But slowly, once the product product is solid and everybody are using it and people can talk great things about it, now we are, it's not that we are increasing the price or something, we are a bit more rigid. We'll say, hey, these are the four or five options which we are open. All other options, it's not working out for us kind of a thing. So basically, you can move from that stage to the next yeah, be more flexible in the initial phase until your product is stabilized. After that, you can come. Still, it can't be a single price. At least you can have a two, three models. You can stop there. Suppose as you said, like the enterprise industry in paper download, right? And suppose they have like five thousand people. Yeah. So how do we like ask them to implement this? How do they like download? Okay. Number one, typically these things don't go to the market. Uh, these things are typically posted in one of their intranet servers and we will say that anybody who wants to use it have to download it from there and we'll put a counter there to check how many people are downloading it. And we will disable the phone to phone transfer and stuff like that just to avoid uh, people doing one download and then multiple people using it. So typically the distribution is through outside market, inside the intranet of the customer. Most likely your app will be very much customized to that customer. You will not be selling the same app to every customer. Definitely you will be making modifications to, the, to that customer. So it, it makes sense to put it inside their intranet. 
Uh, we have tools available. Uh, that's not a complex thing. In fact, that's probably the easiest thing. That is not a problem at all. The tough thing is getting a model which works for both you and the customer. Exactly. Uh, when we're talking about pricing right now, it's coming the end of pricing. Yeah. But when, when there's a proposal, a useful proposal, uh -huh. that's where the requirements are like at a higher level. Ah, uh, I got it. Actually, and how you estimate and give a, a, a more perfect. Actually, we are not experts in that, to be frank. Okay. We are more like we built application. We try to sell the application as it is. But invariably, customers come and ask for customizations on it, which we can estimate easily. Because we have already built the app, we know how much extra effort it takes to do that. But when you're starting from the scratch, let's say Indian government releases a, a RFP for developing a mobile app, we are not experts. It's not that we can't do it, probably uh, somebody else should answer that question. I'm not uh, right okay. uh, yeah. You talked about how have, having it free on the market helps Correct. people Correct. gives you experience that enterprises users download it and try it, is that why? Very much. Very much. Everybody. In fact, these days, everybody are asking for market URL. That's the first question they are asking. Where is the free app? Let me download and use it. Uh, we have observed that in some companies, people go out of their way to buy an Android phone, download the app, try it, and then go to their manager and say, yes, this is a good one. It's basically, people are willing to make that uh, thing because people are becoming more and more confident about the capability of Android. And on top of it, your app adds value. So yes, it happens a lot. And uh, in fact, that is one of the strong, strongest, uh, what do you say, um, promotions that you can have. People going to market, typing some words, searching and finding your app is a real, uh, even in enterprise. You uh, in terms of the go-to-market strategy, huh. what has been your experience uh, in terms of approaching the enterprise as a consumer, vis-a-vis -vis partnering with uh, uh, you know, telecom value chain players such as an operator or a OEM? Uh, okay. who, has, who has a strong enterprise strategy and then going, especially in uh, emerging markets such as India. Right. We have tried for, in two cases, we have tried to go with a uh, telecom partner, but in both cases, for some reason, it didn't work out. So what we have observed is, there is very little value add that the telecom provider can do in this case, except in those cases where there is a very big account, where the telecom provider has uh, already a very huge market, where the distribution, support, especially support, right. if they have those. In that case, they can do the real value add and they also get benefit, let's say, uh, X percentage of the total revenue, whatever it is. In such cases, having a telecom provider really helps. Otherwise, what happens is that telecom provider is not interested. Maybe you are you are, you are willing to work with them, but they are, for them, it's a very small pipe. For them, selling a general app to millions of people is much more uh, um, making sense than uh, investing in this. So that's what we have observed. For some reason, they are kind of sitting as silent partners. Okay, I have a great network. You want to come with me, you come with me. That's when they stop. They really don't do any value add to your actual selling process. And is it specific to emerging markets or the case is same for developed markets? Uh, in both our cases, it was in India only. Okay. So I'm not able to compare it with uh, outside India. Uh, the end session here, we thank Mr. Nagar for being thank here. You. Please give him a big round of applause.